And today, I want to speak to you about being fully committed to the Lord. And we're going to be looking at the life of Asa as an example to us. If you would turn in the scripture to 2 Chronicles 14, we're going to be reading a few verses uh, in three chapters, starting in 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verse 2. Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He removed the foreign altars and the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and to obey his laws and commands. Going down to verse 10. Asa went out to meet him, that is uh, Zerah the Cushite that that's referring to, and they took up battle positions in the valley of Zephanah near Marish. Then Asa called to the Lord his God and said, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, Lord our God, for we rely on you, and in your name we have come against this vast army. Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere mortals prevail against you. And the Lord struck down the Cushites before Asa and Judah. Going to chapter 15, verse 1, The Spirit of God came on Azariah, son of Oded, He went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. For a long time Israel was without the true gods, without a priest to teach, and without the law. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him, and he was found by them. In verse 12, they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord their God, the God of their ancestors, with all their heart and their soul. And then chapter 16, verse 2, Asa then took silver and gold out of the treasuries of the Lord's temple and of his own palace and sent it to Ben-Hadid, king of Aram, who was ruling in Damascus. Let there be a treaty between me and you, he said, as there was between my father and your father. See, I am sending you silver and gold. Now break your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so he will withdraw from me. And then finally, verses 7 to 9. As the time Hanai the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you relied on the king of Aram and not on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped from your hand. Were not the Cushites and the Libyans a mighty army with great numbers and chariots and horsemen? Yet when you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And at the that you have done a foolish thing, and from now on you will be at war. Let us pray. Dear God, it is our cry that we never stray from you, Lord. So God, I pray this day, Lord, that you would give all of us ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us this day. Lord God, I pray that you would use this message and use me to deliver the word that you want everyone individually here to hear this day. And may it be exactly and only what you want said. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So my key text is from 2 Chronicles 16.9, the first part of that verse. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts 
are fully committed to him. Now the second half of that verse says you have done a foolish thing and from now on you will be at war. So this first half of the verse may be something that's very familiar to you. But what's important to look at that verse in the context of scripture. And I think many times we memorize and we think about those parts of the word that we like. But we don't look at the things that we don't like and that's really the conviction and the judgment that came in the second part of the verse that Asa would be at war. 1 Corinthians 10.1, and it was speaking about the Israelites and their wandering in the desert, said, these things have happened to them as examples and were written as warnings to us. If you think about Israel's history, sometimes they were with the Lord and then they would fall away. God would send a judge, a deliverer. And here I want to say that Asa's life followed the same pattern of being with God and then falling away. And that I believe that Asa's life provides a warning to us. Before I get into what it means to be fully committed to the Lord, I want to give you a little historical overview. Think about who were the first three kings of Israel. We had Saul. And who else was that after him? David. And then Solomon. 1 Kings 11.4 says, As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. That's a warning to all of us because and particularly leaders, because as the leader goes, in the case of Israel, so went the nation. So after Solomon, the nation of Israel divided into a northern kingdom, and that consisted of ten tribes and continued to be called Israel, and a southern kingdom, which included the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, and that um, they went by the name Judah. So now Asa was the third king of Judah. That's after the kingdom divided, and he was the first good king. But only 20 years had elapsed, or a, a, a half a generation, between the time of Solomon and the time of Asa. In 2 Chronicles, as we read in chapters 14 and 15, it describes the first 35 years of Asa's reign, where he was fully committed to the Lord, and then chapter 16 looks at the last six years of Asa's reign where he was not fully committed to the Lord. So turning again to our key text in 2 Chronicles 6, 16, 9, and I would say I'm going to be reading a lot of scripture uh, from 2 Chronicles in this message, so you'll want to keep your um, Bible open to that section. But for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth, again, to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Now the eyes of the Lord refer to God's omniscience. God has the ability to know everything that occurs everywhere at the same time. God looks at the heart. So what is the heart? That's our internal thoughts, our desires, our emotions. He's not just looking at our actions, what we say, but he's looking internally at us. And he's looking for those whose hearts are fully committed to him. He's constantly on the lookout for that. And he gives a promise to strengthen them. The message translation puts it this way. God is always on the alert, constantly on the lookout for people who are totally committed to him. You were foolish to go for human help when you could have had God's help. The phrase fully committed literally in Hebrew means to be perfect toward him. The phrase has also been translated loyal to him, blameless toward him, or true to him. But this call to perfection is not sinless perfection. 
For as in the Bible, in 1 John 1, 8, it says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. The emphasis on this verse is on relationship. God is looking for those who are fully and totally committed, perfect, blameless, true, loyal, devoted, and dedicated to him. God is jealous, and he does not want to share our love with anyone or anything. God desires a relationship with each one of us, and that is why he sent his son to die on the cross for us. For it is because of Jesus and also the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives that we have that relationship. And it is impossible to live a life fully committed to God without that in our lives. So to be fully committed to the Lord, we need to have a commitment to seek him, to listen to him, to obey him, and to rely on him. And we must do that consistently and continually. So first, to be committed to the Lord, we must be committed to seek him. During the time of reform, if we look at 2 Chronicles 15, 12, the word says, they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, with all their heart and soul. Now, a covenant was something very serious. This was not something that was half-hearted to these people in Judah. For we see in verse 13, all who would not seek the Lord, the God of Israel, would be put to death, whether small or great, man or woman. The people of Judah would have probably, in thinking about the covenant, thought back to the time of Abraham and his descendants and the promise, the covenant that was made to Abraham in Genesis 12, 2 to 3. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people on the earth will be blessed through you. That promise is not only for Ju Judah, but that's for us today as members of all those nations that are blessed through Abraham. But as they thought about that promise, they would also have thought about the cost. Because Abraham was called by God to sacrifice Isaac on the altar, that son of his, the covenant promise, but after Abraham demonstrated total obedience and got ready almost to put that knife into Isaac, God provided a ram. And God sealed the covenant of Abraham with blood. The God's covenant today is with us. God has sealed the covenant by the blood of Jesus Christ Amen. and his sacrifice that was done for us. Because it's through that blood, through that sacrifice, we have the opportunity to receive eternal life. Amen. Prophets in the old times would frequently call the people back to God. And the call from Isaiah 55, 6, uh, is, I think, is equally applicable to us today. We're to seek the Lord while he may be found to call on him while he is near, to let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts, and let them return to the God, for he will have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. But we are to seek God and worship him because of who he is, in Psalm 24, 3 to 6, it says, the word says, we may who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? 
who may stand in his holy place. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Too often I think we seek the hand of God. We don't seek the face of God. We look for what he is going to do for us. But we need to pursue him, to seek his face, Why? Because we want to be with us, because he loves us. And the Bible instructs us how we are to seek him. We are to seek him with all our heart and all our soul. In verse 15, 15, uh, in 2 Chronicles, Judah was rejoicing because they had sworn an oath wholeheartedly and they sought God eagerly. So as we look at those words, a wholehearted seeking, and the result was eagerness. Because in a wholehearted commitment to God, there is joy. Think back to the time when you first entered into that relationship with the Lord. Think about the zeal you had. Think about the desire that you had for every person to come into the same knowledge that you had and your desire and you did talk to everybody who would give you an ear to listen about the great things that God had done in your life. Do you have that same zeal today? Because there's a consistent call in scripture to be fully committed and seek God and that seeking is expressed in our love for him. Our motive is love. Everything, though, starts not with our love, but with God's love. In a familiar scripture, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only, one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And in Romans 5.5, 5, God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been freely given to us. Pastor Solomon, a couple weeks ago, spoke of the Old Testament Great Commandment, which God instructed through Moses in Deuteronomy 6, 5, which says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And Jesus again reinforced this in the Great Commandment in Matthew 22, 37 again. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. So Asa demonstrated not only uh, to us a commitment, number one, to seek God, but secondly, he demonstrated a commitment to listen to God. We see in 2 Chronicles 15.2, the prophet Azariah was speaking by the Spirit and said, listen to me, Asa and Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. And then continuing on in verse 8, when Asa heard these words, he heard those words that the prophet spoke, by Azariah the son of Oded the prophet, and he took courage, and he removed the detestable idols. Asa heard, he listened, to the words of the prophet. And he instituted reforms and continued in his commitment to the Lord. But unfortunately, later in his life, a rebuke came from the seer, and we will see later that Asa did not listen to the Lord. God is calling us to continue to listen to him. And he has given us the Holy Spirit to be our guide. I'm thankful today that the Holy Spirit has been given to all believers 
the Holy Spirit was no longer like in the Old Testament coming only to a few people for a specific purpose for a limited time but we have the Holy Spirit with us always Isaiah 51 verses 1 and 4 says listen to me you who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord look to the rock from whom you were cut and to the quarry from which you were hewn listen to me my people hear me my nation instruction will go out from me my justice will become a light to the nations in the book whisper mark batterson says um, this we usually hear what we want to hear and we turn a deaf ear to everything else but remember the package deal if we don't listen to everything God has to say, we won't hear anything he has to say. And we probably need to hear most what we want to hear least. By this I know for sure his tone is always loving. Sometimes it's tough love in the form of a rebuke or discipline, but it's loving nevertheless, and it's loving all the more. So I want to repeat this thing. We probably need to hear most what we want to hear least. But we need to listen to everything that God has to say. God is calling each of us to seek him and to listen to him. But listening requires discernment. It requires tuning out all the noise and all the distractions, which can be difficult. But we must play in the place that we can quiet ourselves and listen to God. About a month ago, on, past, on uh, December 31st, Pastor Greg encouraged us to hear from God that one word that would make an impact on our lives for 2018 rather than making many resolutions which are quickly broken. As he was preaching, there were many words that swirled around in my head. But when I got home and I prayed, God gave me a different word. And when I know I heard the voice of the Lord, I went and I said, God, I don't really like that word. Won't you give me a different word? But I continued to pray, and no other word came. <laughs> but I knew, and I said to the Lord, I'm your sheep, and I know your voice, and I will follow you, what you're speaking to me. And I asked God to give me insight, because it wasn't really clear what all this meant from, my, and from the word. And God did speak to me, and God has continued to speak to me over the last month and draw me back to that word. So I would say to you, if you have not received that word from the Lord, for you specifically for 2018, there's still time. But you must be willing to be quiet and listen to God and hear everything he has to say, which may or may not be what you want to hear. But be confident in this, that we have a loving Father. And our loving Father knows what we need, and he wants the best for us. Mark Batterson, in another book, All In, said, We want to spend eternity with God. We just don't want to spend time with him. We stand and stare from a distance, satisfied with superficiality. We Facebook more than we seek his face. We text more than we study the text. And our eyes aren't fixed on Jesus. They're fixed on our iPhones and our iPads with the emphasis on I. And then we wonder why God feels so different. different. So seeking God's face and hearing from him requires time. Time to study, time to worship, 
time to pray, and I would say that's with both in understanding and in the spirit, and time to listen to him in prayer. So we must not only have a commitment to seek the Lord, secondly, a commitment to listen to the Lord, but thirdly, we must have a commitment to obey him. We see in Second Chronicles 15:8, Asa removed the idols that were detestable to God. The word says, when Asa heard these words and the prophecy, he removed the detestable idols from the whole land of Judah and Benjamin, and from the towns he had captured in the hills of Ephraim. And dropping down to verse 11, at that time they sacrificed to the Lord 700 head of cattle and 7,000 sheep and goats from the plunder they had brought back. We see here that Asa worshipped the Lord, and he sacrificed the animals from their plunder, which was in the, uh, according to what really God had specified in the word. And then, as we saw earlier, he made a covenant with the Lord to seek him. Asa took care of God's house, in verse 15, 18, he brought back into the temple gold and silver. And in, in verse 8, he repaired the altar of the Lord. But all this was costly to Asa. For we see in uh, 15, 16, King Asa deposed his grandmother Mecca from her position as queen mother because she had made a repulsive image for the worship of Asa. Obeying Jesus also comes with a cost. In Matthew 10, 37, Jesus said, Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. In Hebrew, the concept of believing and doing were essentially the same thing. You couldn't have one without the other. And Josiah, who was another good king in Second Chronicles 34:31, and I'm reading this from the message, says, the king stood by his pillar and before God, solemnly committing himself to the covenant to follow God, believingly and obediently. To follow his instructions, heart and soul, on what to believe and do. To confirm with his life the entire covenant, all that was written in his book. If we look back at the great commandment, Jesus said again, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. To follow that great commandment requires obedience, and it isn't always easy. John 14, 21 says, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. In James 2, 18, Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. But love is our motive. When we are fully committed to the Lord to seek, listen and obey him will we, we will experience positive results from our obedience but nevertheless there will be times of testing and through those times of testing God will refine our character and it's through that time that we have our testimony so as we look at some of the results of Asa's life and being fully committed to the Lord we can experience some of these same positive results from our obedience to God. First of all, 
God's presence is with us. In 2 Chronicles 15, 2, the word says, The Lord is with you when? When you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found of you. God hears our prayers. Asa's prayer is a marvelous example again in 2 Chronicles 14, 11. Then Asa called to the Lord his God and said, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, Lord our God, for we rely on you. And in your name we have come against this vast army. Lord, you are our God. Do not let mortals prevail against you. So God's presence is with us. He hears our prayers. And thirdly, God will fight our battles. In verse 8, we see that Judah had 580,000 men. And in verse 9, the Cushites uh, had thousands of thousands or a million men. And not only that, but Judah had far less weapons. In the natural, the battle, it was impossible. They were outnumbered, they more than half almost. But as Asa called on the Lord in prayer in verse 11, we read, God intervened. And if we look at verse 12, the Lord was not man, but the Lord struck down the Cushites, who were later referred to as Ethiopians before Asa and Judah. And the Cushites fled, and Asa and his army pursued them as far as Gerar. Such a great number of the Cushites fell that they could not recover. They were crushed before the Lord and his forces. And the men of Judah carried off large amount of plunder. They destroyed all the villages around Gerar, and the Bible there tells us why they could destroy the villages. It was because the terror of the Lord had fallen on them. This was not the terror of man. It was God at work, the terror of the Lord that was upon them. And the defeat of the Ethiopians was so big that they never attacked Israel for another 200 years. So as we've looked about God's presence being with us, and that he hears our prayers and he fights our battles. And fourthly, he will give us peace. In Second Chronicles 15, 15, the word says, So the Lord gave them rest on every side. And although there was probably border skirmishes with Israel over the years, this battle with the Ethiopians was the only one, the only war in the first 35 years of Asa's life. But I think there's a greater type of peace, a peace that we can experience, a peace that's in our hearts that God gives us so that no matter what is going on around us, we can have peace. But we have a choice even in that peace because as Colossians 3.15 said, is let the peace of God rule in your heart. We have to choose to experience God's peace and not to worry. Psalm 119 starts, I think at verse 165 says, Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. I wait for your salvation, Lord, and follow your commands. I obey your statutes for, and love them greatly. I obey your precepts and your statutes for for all your work will be rewarded. God's presence and peace were rewards. The spoil was also our reward in the natural because our ways are known to God. In 2 Chronicles 15, 7, but as for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. God's peace and presence were rewards. The plunder was a reward in the natural. But we look to the ultimate reward in heaven. As it was said in Matthew 25, 21, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. 
and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. In spite of our failures, another result of obedience is God gives us a legacy. We can see here even just the family of Christina today. God uses imperfect people, and I believe no one sees our imperfections more than our children. Jehoshaphat succeeded Asa, his father, as king, and in 2 Chronicles 17, 3-6, the word says, The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the ways of his father David before him. He did not consult the Baals, but sought the God of his father and followed his commands rather than the precepts of Israel. The Lord established the kingdom under his control, and all Judah was brought gifts to Jehoshaphat so that he had great wealth and honor. His heart was devoted to the ways of the Lord, and furthermore, he removed the high places of the Asherah poles from Judah. You know, even though I don't have children, I've come to know how much the children in this church are watching all of us. When I came back to uh, the services after my surgery, one of the girls in the girls' ministry wanted to know where I had been because she hadn't seen me here. So our children really do notice more than we think they do, and I just encourage all of us to live a life that's holy and pleasing to the Lord before them. So to be fully committed to the Lord is also to not only to seek him and listen to him and to obey him, but also to rely on him. God wants us to trust him and not man. When Asa was outnumbered and attacked by the Ethiopians, he relied on the Lord. But when he came against Judah towards the end of his reign, Asa relied on man. The seer Hanai in 16.7 says, Because you relied on the king of Aram and not on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped from your hands. Were not the Cushites and Libyans a mighty army with great numbers, chariots, and horsemen? Yet when you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hands. We can see in verse 7 that if Asa had relied on God, he would not have only had victory over the Israelites, he would also have had uh, victory over the Syrians who have continued to be an enemy of Israel. Proverbs 19, 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. So finally, we need to be consistently and continually fully committed to the Lord. Azariah, the prophet, cautioned Asa in verse 15, 7 to not give up. But after 35 years of being fully committed to the Lord, Asa fell. We turn to 2 Chronicles 16, 3. Asa then took the silver and gold out of the treasuries of the Lord's temple. So there he was robbing God of what had been placed there before and of his own palace and sent it to ben king of Aram, who was ruling in Damascus. So let there be a treaty between me and you, he said, as there was between my father and your father. See, I am sending you silver and gold. Now break your treaty with Basin, king of Israel, so he will withdraw from me. Asa there made a covenant with man instead of a covenant with God. And we can see in verses 4 and 5 that Asa joined forces with the Syrians, and he did conquer Israel, but as we saw just at the beginning, he acted foolishly. Because we sin, we have to ha and, and we want to have that commitment, uh, constant commitment to serve Christ, it requires us to repent. It requires us to listen to correction. Correction frequently comes through the still, quiet voice of God as the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. Where we have missed the mark, and it may be something we did wrong or something we didn't do. But God will also use people and other circumstances to show us and give us insight. Asa did not listen to the warning of the prophet that hardened his heart, for in 2 Chronicles 16.10 we see that Asa was angry with the seer because of this, and he was so enraged he put him in prison, and at the same time 
Asa brutally oppressed his people. But Asa still had an opportunity to repent and rely on the Lord because in verse 12, which is now three years later, in the 39th year of Asa's reign, Asa was afflicted with a disease in his feet. Though his disease was severe, even in his illness, he did not seek the help from the Lord, but only from the physician. While God does not cause disease, he can use circumstances to get our attention. The problem was not here with, with using physicians or medicines because I believe that God gives people the knowledge they have and, and the knowledge to find these medicines that we use. The problem was that Asa relied only on the physicians. He did not rely on the Lord. If we look at the life of Hezekiah, who was at the point of death, he was another king. And when the prophet Isaiah confronted him, he repented, he cried out to the Lord, and God gave him 15 more years to his life. You can see that in 2 Kings 20. But Asa, on the other hand, suffered for two more years before his death with a severe disease. If you think about a tree, with every year those roots go deeper and it gets another you know, core, another ring, and it's getting stronger. And I think that as we continue to be fully committed to the Lord, we can claim the promise of Jeremiah 17.7, 17, the blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in the year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. So as we turn back to our key verse in conclusion, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. To be fully committed to him requires us to seek God, to listen to him, to obey him, and to rely on him consistently throughout our days. And our commitment is summed up in the word love, for God is love. And I would ask that you turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. Verse 1. For Asa's life reminds me of this warning. To the, to the angel in the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have ended, endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you have at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. For if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. But there's the promise. Whoever has ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. As Paul said in Philippians 3, 13 to 14, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize that God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. 
In 1 Kings 15, 15, we see that God's view of people is very different from our own. It says, For David had done what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not failed to keep any of the Lord's commands all the days of his life, except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. Now, we might say that David was a murderer, but what did God say? God said David was a man after his own heart. So upon hearing this message, you may think that you are not good enough, and you are correct, because no one is good enough. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But yet there is a promise that follows in Romans 3.24, And all are justified freely by his grace the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Jesus offers forgiveness to all who ask him. 1 John 1, 9 states, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If you do not know Jesus, Today can be the day that you come to know Jesus. You can experience peace and joy. So I would ask if there's anyone here who has never asked Jesus to be Lord of his life, to start that life where you can walk and be committed to him, I would like to pray with you. So with every eye closed, if you want to start that life with Jesus today, if you've never made a commitment to follow him, I would ask that you would raise your hand so that I could pray with you and that you could begin this new life with Jesus. The Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart. Don't be afraid to raise your hand for it's a wonderful life that God has called us to. All right. As I'm speaking here now to Christians, I ask, are you fully committed to the Lord? We sing Jesus is the center of it all, but is he truly the center? Have you lost your first love? If Jesus is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. Jesus must be Lord of all. But God will not violate our free will. It is our choice to daily live in his presence. So as we sing the next song, I ask you to consider if you have fully surrendered everything to him. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal those areas in your life which are not fully given over to him. Ask the Lord to purify your heart so that through his help you can be holy and fully committed to him.
Oh. 